I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. It's an age-old problem, people not paying to ride the bus or subway. There's a new study out to help with that problem. But first, a bold experiment in Brooklyn. For five days in April, a two-block area in Brownsville implemented a simple yet unconventional idea to let neighbors, not the police, respond to low-level street crime, as well as handle some 911 calls from the area. It's part of the Brownsville Safety Alliance group with the goal of helping fewer people get arrested and entangled in the criminal justice system. We're joined by uh, New York Times Police Headquarters Bureau Chief Maria Kramer. She'll talk about the story she wrote for the New York Times. Maria, how did that system work? The way that it works is um, quite simple. You have um, members of an anti-violence group called Brownsville and Violence Out. They are sort of trained violence interrupters, but they're residents of Brownsville or they were, they were raised in Brownsville. And they stand sentry for, uh, as you said, five days on a two block stretch in this neighborhood, Brownsville in Brooklyn, while uh, the police in plain clothes are nearby. And they refer the 911 calls, any 911 calls that come in, any 311 calls that come in are referred then to, to the men and women who work for Brownsville and Violence Out, or Bevo for short. It seems sort of counterintuitive uh, removing the police from dealing with crime, but how well did these people, the community people, deal with it instead of the cops? Well, I think that that's part of um, what makes this so fascinating is that the police are there. They are seeing what, what the members of Bevo are seeing, but they are not responding the way that they might normally would. They're not approaching the situation. They're certainly not making any arrests. They're letting these men and women um, um, respond first. And uh, and usually it fizzles out very quickly. I mean, I was there when, when there was um, a fight that broke out in front of a bodega. This is the kind of thing that normally somebody would, and, and then there was a 911 call that was made. And normally the police would show up and break it up. And, if they found out that there was a restraining order, which in this case there was, a person would be apprehended and, and arrested. In this case, um, all it took was a member of Bevo just sort of slowly and very confidently walking over, assessing the situation and just telling the, you know, the man who had made the 911 call, go back in the bodega, we'll take care of it. Anytime something comes up, call me. And then finding the other man who would um, sort of instigated the altercation and telling him, stay away. And it's that simple. I think that the, the, the premise of it is just that things can quiet down quickly if you have somebody with credibility, somebody who knows this neighborhood and knows the people in it involved and, and, and you know, quickly putting a stop to what otherwise could turn into something much more serious. Um, Maria, how do these people develop the credibility when there's an altercation, when something else like that is going on? Somebody walks over and says, I'm intervening, in effect, on behalf of the police, but I'm your neighbor. How uh, do the participants in this altercation recognize that this is someone in authority? Well, that's a great question. And the way that they do that is because, um, first, they've, they've grown up there. People know them. And uh, the head of Bevo, um, a man by the name of Deshaun Ahmed, who goes by the nickname Bigga, he has a criminal past. He has a serious criminal past when he talks about quite openly. And that gives him um, um, the ability to tell people, I know what it's like to be in prison. I know what happens when you make the wrong decision. So, you know, take it from me. You don't want to make the wrong decision here. That's that right there is giving a layer of credibility that helps him so much when he when he approaches people and he's out there all the time. And so are the members of, of his crew. So they already know him. They this is there was this infrastructure was already in place in a way because um, this group has been around for so long and people know them and trust them because they know that they are there to squash beefs to end to, to, to prevent violence. So that's that's those are the two ways that these people have developed that credibility. One, they have a past that that mirrors the past that many of the people in Brownsville have, or you know, know somebody who has. And two, um, you know, they grew up there. They they know the neighborhood and and they love the neighborhood, and that gives them so much credibility with the people of that community because they know these people are here to help. What level of crime or complaints do these people deal with? There, I, we describe it as low level, and the reason why we describe it as low level is because they're not, you know, these are, they're, they're, it's not like they're interrupting shootings. 
right? I mean, if there's a shooting, if there's a very serious incident there, or you know, um, a domestic incident where where you know things have become very violent, um, and there's a chance someone could get seriously hurt, and you need the police to get involved, that that's why you have the police there. So that they're not going to respond to shootings. The police are there in case you have something that you know, rises to that level. Um, or, for example, if there is a victim involved and the victim says, well, I appreciate that you're here and that you're the community and that you want to stop violence, but I really want to make an, I want somebody to make an arrest here. I'm a victim and I'm a victim of a crime. So the police would become involved um, in that type of situation. That's that's how they've worked it out so that um, not only the police feel um, better about about engaging in this program, but also the residents of Brownsville. You pointed out in the Times article that this was the idea of a precinct commander. How do the uh, cops think this worked out, this experiment? The police that were there, that uh, the days that I was there, definitely had buy-in. You could see that they trusted the men and the women who were on the streets responding to to, to what they were seeing. Um, they they just they they stepped back. They gave them space. Um, and when they saw that they had it under control, they would actually say, yep, yeah, they got it. They have it under control. So police buy-in on this is very important um, because not only just because they refer the 911 calls and the 311 calls to, to the people um, um, who are part of the Brownsville Safety Alliance, but you know, also because you need them to trust the, the officers who are there, you need them to trust in the, in the people who are there so that they don't get involved and you let the community members handle these as, as we described, these low-level incidents. Do they plan to replicate the program or expand it uh, within Brownsville or repeat it again? I know that Bevo wants to do this every day, all the time. They they are they they really believe in in, in its in its power. Um, the uh, inspector that I spoke with, who's now in charge of the 73rd precinct, um, Mark Vasquez, he said that he would like to see it happen more often throughout the year. Maybe not every day. <laughs> the logistics of that would be a little tricky for the police department. But he would like to see it happen more often and maybe have the police take on uh, a less of an anonymous role and, you know, maybe also set up a table and talk to people in the community, try to use it as a recruiting uh, um, effort to, to, to get people of Brownsville and, you know, into the police academy. Um, there are a lot of ways that this could get expanded. Uh, right now, it's pretty much concentrated to this neighborhood in Brownsville, but there, the, the city is putting money into, into um, making it more cohesive and, and getting more resources on the ground. So um, it's, it remains to be seen how, how, whether this experiment will be replicated in other parts of the city, but there is investment, there is interest, and, and, um, and there's definitely buy-in. And are the community people volunteers? The community people um, are, it's a, it's a combination, well, Bebo is, is a group of people who are, these are paid staffers. This is a, this is an organization um, um, of paid workers. So they're, they're technically not volunteers. They, they work all year round and this is part of their duties. And is there any indication uh, statistically how this has had an impact on crime uh, within that precinct or within that two block area? So that's a really good question. And the answer is a little hard to give because it's, we're talking five days, um, you know, a couple, two or three times out of the year. Um, so the measurable impact is something that is hard to, 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 to really show. But what you, what you can see is that, at, at, that this is happening. This, this, this program has been going on at, at a time when Brownsville is seeing a positive trend in crime statistics. You've seen homicides go down. You've seen shootings go down. You've seen robberies. Uh, grand larceny autos, which have been going up in other parts of the city, going down. So the trends in Brownsville are are are, are encouraging, and there is a theory. I spoke with the Kings County District Attorney um, um, about this, and his theory was that if you've got more people in the community concerned about what's happening on the street, showing that they're out there and that they're watching, it has a deterrent. It can have a deterrent effect. So there's 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 definitely a feeling that you know, hey, is this a coincidence? Um, or is this happening as, as this positive trend is, is happening because it, it is having a direct effect? Marie, as you pointed out and mentioned in the Times article, uh, at least one of the people involved is a former inmate, a uh, former gang member. Why does he participate in this program? He came out of, well, he's the head of Brownsville in, in uh, Violence Out. And I, I mean, he's so passionate about this. I have never seen somebody so committed to being um, on this two, you know, a small stretch of, 
of um, you know of an area and 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 getting involved with as much as possible. I actually began to worry a little bit about his mental and physical health because it seems like he works round the clock, and he's just he just loves Brownsville, and I think that he came out of prison with a lot of regret and uh, a lot of determination to try and do things differently. I think that's where that comes from. Did any of these incidents escalate or were all of them resolved fairly peaceably? Everything was resolved that I witnessed very peacefully. There was, uh, you know, there, were, there was a large group of teenagers. They started following and chasing after this young girl. It was clear they were trying to fight her. And, and just like that, you know, um, you see, you see the, the people from Bevo sort of redirecting them, just waving them away. That's all it took. She's like, it's not going to happen today. Whatever you want to do, this is not happening right now. And the kids listened. They just scattered, you know, still yelling and still cursing, but they scattered and the girl was safe. And then same with the bodega incident. Um, there, I, I, yeah, you see, you see just how these little moments could turn into something really bad if the if if you don't have people there responding to it and 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 and, and seeing how easily it fizzled out how quickly it fizzled out uh, it was a, it's a testament to, to to the effort that that's gone into this um, um a, alliance a new breakthrough in community policing i guess maria kramer police bureau chief of the new york times thanks for joining us and coming up next we'll look at fair beating and what the mta plans to do about it. It's been a problem for years, fare beating, people not paying the cost of a ride on subways and buses, resulting in huge financial losses for the city. Now the MTA is looking beyond enforcement after $690 million a year in fare evasion. Here to explain the whole situation, Anna Lay, Metro reporter for the New York Times. And Anna, if we know $690 million is lost in fair evasion, why can't we collect that amount? Well, that is a very complicated question. You know, um, the police can't be everywhere all at the same time. And then you also get into issues of affordability, which you know, some left-leaning uh, politicians um, and advocates would say, you know, the, the problem is that some people just simply can't afford it. And then, of course, you've got people who just walk through the emergency gates because it's easy. So it's really just sort of, a, you know, a crime of opportunity. Um, so, you know, it's just such a vast system and you really can't be everywhere all at once. And there is an affordability crisis in the city. So it's, it's just a very tangled issue. So how do we reconcile that? How do we say some people can't afford it and we're going to lower fares for them, create a fair fare program as we have to some extent, and others we're going to increase enforcement? Yeah, so, you know, this uh, new report that you just mentioned uh, it aims to sort of address that with different approaches. In the past, a lot of it was just police, 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 and now they're really trying to, uh, you know, look at some of these softer approaches like expanding the Fair Fares program, which gives people, you know, a 50% discount on their fares. Uh, you know, what, what the report is calling for is that the... Um, the threshold, you know, the salary threshold be doubled from uh, what it is now. Right now, it's at the federal poverty level, which is about $30,000 a year. Which is a relatively arbitrary figure anyway. It's also very low. You no. know, if, if, you know, you listen to uh, the arguments from, you know, people who put together this report and also many people who advocate for poor New Yorkers, this is a very expensive city. Mm -hmm. And $30,000 does not go a very long way here. So they're calling for that to be doubled so that um, more people can take advantage of the program. Uh, lots of summonses. You point out in the article that in uh, last year, the enforcement rose by 28%, 80,000 fair evasion summonses. Now, is that enforcement or is that a paper chase? Who pays those 80,000 summonses? That is a really good question that I have not gotten an answer to despite many efforts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are concerns that sometimes um, these uh, efforts to, to recoup money from uh, people who don't pay fines actually ends up exceeding the amount that you're able to get back from them. So that is something that a lot of agencies struggle with, not just here in New York, but 
Uh, Seattle, you know, uh, did a study that showed that they simply could not figure out how much they were actually getting back. So, like, what was the return on investment? They, mm -hmm. they couldn't figure it out. So, um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to know that. It's hard to know how much they're actually recouping from people. And, and as far as the summonses, you know, I, I'm fairly certain that uh, fair evasion summonses are the more people get these kinds of tickets than than anything else, uh, you know, from the police. Uh, um, these types of summonses, and so yeah, they're issued a lot, uh, uh, and they sort of were replaced. Um, they replaced arrests a few years ago after advocates, you know. Uh, were bothered that they were arresting so many people, largely people of color for these things. And so this was sort of the replacement, but it still penalizes people. It, you know, they can still have their, their wages garnished. So it's still something that are, they're getting a lot of heat about. And as you pointed out, it's sort of a tax on, on poverty. It's uh, uh, policing poverty, if you will, as according to some of the critics. So what's the answer to something like that? And, and how do we determine what people should pay in a fair fare? Well, um, you know, the the report is also looking, besides the, the fair fares expansion, it's also looking at uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that it's looking at is um, making the turnstiles like harder to jump over with these big plexiglass mm -hmm. panes that would you know, flip open and close as you walk through, uh, because the turnstiles are pretty easy to jump over, especially if you're For in some good people. shape. Exactly, if you're in, in pretty good shape, they're not tough to jump over. <laughs> um, and, and some people, you know, they'll squeeze through if they're small enough uh, together. Uh, um, so, so they're they're looking at that. They're also looking at um, camera technology to try to see where people you know, skip the fare the most. That way they can funnel resources in that direction rather than somewhat arbitrarily, which is what they do now. Although you point out in the article on something I guess I should have realized, Anna, that uh, the real fare evasion goes on in buses. Uh, how do you deal with that, especially people getting on the back of the buses? Yes, uh, the report I think very astutely points out that most fare evasion happens on buses, even though the rhetoric has uh, largely focused on subways, um, you know, and, and that, that's, you know, people have this stereotype, I guess, in their head of like, you know, people just not caring and just running through. And, and there's so many different types of people that, that skip the fare. And, and most of it does happen on buses where actually there isn't that much enforcement. And so these um, panelists who put together this report are saying, you know, we should really put more resources there and, um, um, you know, uh, also give the, the, the people that enforce those fares to give them better technology, again, to, you know, be able to look up someone if they're a repeat offender, if mm -hmm. it's their first time, that way they can sort of respond accordingly to, you know, the severity of the offense. Is there anything done in other cities, particularly on buses, that's more effective? You know, the panelists were asked that at a press conference that they had a couple weeks ago on this, and um, they said pretty much no. <laughs> like, everyone's kind of struggling to figure this out, um, at least in the United States. So it is a really sticky problem that I think a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of agencies are struggling with. It may sound silly, but would it be cheaper not to charge a fare at all rather than go after fare beaters? I don't think so. The system is extremely dependent on fares, more so, at least before the pandemic, more mm -hmm. so than other um, agencies. Um, right now, fares make up a, a much smaller percentage because they've gotten a big funding a boost from the state that mm -hmm. they're very happy about. Um, but it's, I mean, there might be someone out there who disagrees, but if you ask the authority, there's simply no way that it, that they could do that. Although there, that is something that has been uh, pushed uh, pretty heavily uh, by, by uh, you know, again, advocates for the poor and, and people who uh, who really just want the system to be free and to be treated like a, you know, like a public service, mm. like the police or, you know, what have you. One of the things the report talked about is uh, giving discounts for people who receive a summons and pay it immediately, a credit. Isn't that, you know, virtually admitting that people don't comply with the summonses? That if you're, you know, giving them an incentive to actually do what they're supposed to do, that they're not doing it at all? Yeah, you know, I think this is, again, a way, an effort to kind of be a little bit softer with the approach and, and just a little bit more, um, 
empathetic, I mm -hmm. guess, of, of people who might be in, in economic need. Um, again, I don't know what the recoup rate is on those summonses. They're typically a hundred dollars, and so this that's a lot. Yes, it, it can be. I mean, and the argument from some is that if you can't pay two seventy five to ride the subway, how can you pay a hundred dollar summons? Right. Um, and so, yes, this would. Uh, this report is suggesting that if it's your first time, first you, the first time you get a warning. If it's your second time, you get this hundred dollar summons. But then, when you go to the, you know, to the the transit adjudication bureau to get it taken care of, then they give you a uh, fifty dollar credit so mm -hmm. that you, you know, have some money back. How often is that going to happen where people actually pay? I don't know. I, that's a really good question. Bring us up to date, if you will, on congestion pricing, which, of course, is an attempt to get more people onto mass transit and out of their cars. Uh, we have heard about this for years now. Uh, many of us have. And is this getting any closer? Uh, yes, actually, uh, there was some significant movement, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, where uh, the federal government basically gave it a soft yes, <laughs> and um, um, uh, it's 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 a really long history, but basically, right now, there's uh, this waiting period where we're kind of waiting for the, the the final rubber stamp from the federal government, and then at that point. Um, the board that was appointed locally to sort of sort out the, how much exactly everyone's going to get charged, who's going to get um, credits, who's going to get discounts. Uh, you know, uh, they're they're kind of hashing all that out, or they're going to hash all that out once the federal government gives the okay. And as soon as spring 2024, this could actually become a reality. And the main advantage of that, at least theoretically, is one to reduce congestion and two to generate a presumably vast amount of money to improve mass transit. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I would bring billions of dollars to the agency, to the MTA. Um, money that would be, you know, kind of put in a lockbox to, to be spent on, on capital projects. So it would really just be to improve the system. It wouldn't be um, operating, which is what fares do. The fair money goes to operating and this would go to capital. So, so this would improve the system, signals, trains, cars, everything else. Exactly. And do we really think very quickly that it would improve congestion, uh, that it would make uh, traffic speeds quicker? You know, I think the uh, there's pretty solid consensus that the answer to that is yes. Uh, there are many, many, many critics out there, uh, and we could talk about this for days, but, but I think generally speaking, yes. Thank you for joining us. Anna Lay of the New York Times covering transportation. And coming up next, my thoughts on a historic moment seven decades later. It was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs. That was how Sylvia Plath began her book, The Bell Jar. That summer began 70 years ago this month. I remember it because it was the night before my fifth birthday. The next day, my father took my sister and me to the corner of our block in Brownsville to watch the funeral procession for the accused spies who had been executed at Sing Sing. It was history happening, and he wanted us to witness it. What's so striking, even seven decades later, is the certainty with which people pronounce the Rosenbergs' innocence or guilt. And guilty of what? After listening to the prosecutor and to Judge Irving Kaufman, the subject of an important new biography, most people would have deemed them guilty of treason, stealing the secret to the atomic bomb, providing it to our enemy, and provoking the Korean War. But the charge wasn't treason. It was conspiracy to commit espionage. By the time the Russians got what they did from Julius Rosenberg, Whatever was secret had already been stolen and delivered to them by other spies. Whatever overt acts the Rosenbergs committed in their conspiracy, they did not betray America to an enemy. The Soviets were an ally during World War II. We've since learned that Judge Kaufman was guilty of hypocrisy, that David Greenglass lied, he told me, about the most damning evidence that sent his sister, Ethel Rosenberg, to the electric chair. 
that Morton Sobel, a third defendant to the case, who also protested his innocence, confessed to me that he had indeed committed espionage. That even the Rosenberg sons now acknowledge that the actual charge of conspiracy was broad enough to legally convict Julius, even if you can frame a guilty man. And yet at the time, there was no middle ground. Regardless of where you stood on the death penalty, everyone was so certain that the jury's guilty verdict was either justified or that it wasn't. Which, with benefit of hindsight, in an era of unwavering convictions, kind of makes you rethink the boundaries of reasonable doubt. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.